So I'm delighted to have with us Stefan Schiffels from the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. Please join me in welcoming Stefan to the podium. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be able to kick off this meeting on the future of migration by giving a talk about the past of migration. I guess it's, the future can only be imagined, but it may be helpful to know where we come from um, to do that properly. So migration has indeed played a major role in almost every chapter of human history. From its very, very earliest beginnings, uh, this is sort of the common model that we now believe in, that humans left Africa around 50 to 60,000 years ago, spread the world first to Asia, then to Europe, and then later to the Americas. 60,000 years ago, that's not that long ago. If you think about it, that's about 2,000 generations. It's not unimaginably large, right? If you had to write that pedigree down in a book, it would be technically possible. Of course, you lack the knowledge, but it's technically possible. So it's, it's, it's not a very large number. And this very story of how many humans in many places across the world came to be is a very story of migration. And this general mode of mobility, this uh, that's sort of what defines us humans, I would say. If there's any constant uh, in human history, then it's probably the fact that we're a mobile species. And I will show you some examples of that. Now, one of the most profound transitions that happened all across the globe in our human history was the transition from foraging and hunting and gathering to a completely different lifestyle of doing agriculture and sedentism and building houses and settlements. And this transition happened everywhere, but it's particularly well described in Western Eurasia and Europe, where archaeology knows how to look for these signs that distinguish the two ways of life. For example, agriculture being associated with ceramics in, burial, in burials or in pots and settlements, of course, but also health condition changed dramatically. For example, dental carriers, the stuff that you still go to the dentist for today, is something that emerged with the starch-rich diet of, uh, of agriculture. So this is something that, uh, that left marks on many levels. And because this transition is so well-defined in agriculture, it can be mapped out to an exquisite detail. And here's a map that shows this transition, how it spread across Western Eurasia, starting about 10,000 BC, that's 12,000 years ago, in the, what we now call the Fertile Crescent, so a region between the Levant and Mesopotamia, and then spreading slowly first to Anatolia, and then even some thousand years later to uh, to southeastern Europe, the Balkans, and then spreading from there to Central Europe, and finally reaching places like Britain and Sweden. You're, we're a bit late to the game, but uh, I think you've been caught up the last 6,000 years, so you're doing just fine. But sort of this major transition in archaeological culture, of course, now a formidable question to ask is, to what extent has this been driven by human migration? Right? And this question was asked for a long time ago, but it was notoriously hard to answer um, before a true scientific revolution took place, which was already, already announced, uh, pioneered by Svante Pebo, Sweden's own Nobel laureate from 2022 in medicine, who pioneered these methods and how to extract DNA from ancient human remains. And ever since this method took off, we have now available to us thousands of ancient genomes uh, that, um, uh, that can be analyzed um, to exactly answer questions like the one here, whether the Neolithic revolution, the change from uh, hunting and gathering to agriculture was driven by migration. And indeed, already in 2010, before many more ancient genomes came out, the first ancient data pointed to a clear disruption in the genetic profile. So essentially, people with farming, people with farming uh, uh, um, archaeological features ha had a massive genetic difference from people with um, hunter-gatherer um, ar um, archaeological features. This difference is about as big, or was about as big as today, we see between genetic profiles between people living in Europe and East Asia. So two quite genetically distinct populations came together and mixed subsequently, okay? So we today have actually both of these ancestries in us. Now, because we now have so many more genomes, we can actually build quite 
detailed computational models. And ju I just want to show you this one that we published last year that's a, a com basically a machine learning method that feeds on thousands of these ancient genomes from Western Eurasia in the last 10,000 years. And we're able to ask the computer where a specific genetic profile would be found at a specific time. And here we use the profile of one of these first farmers in southwestern Germany, at least, Stuttgart. That's a city in southwestern Germany. Uh, one of these first populations that produced farming. And we can ask, where does the ancestry of this individual fall at different time points? And you can see, when we now start um, running this video, that the, the ancestry really starts down in the Middle East a long time ago and then transitions up to the Balkans about 6,000 years B BC and then goes further uh, into Central Europe. And you can really see this change of ancestry that's of course connected to a change of people. And if you con connect the timeline of this video with the archaeology, you see this kind of very close genetic map. So in this case, it was very clear that this transition of culture was connected to a transition of people actually. So that's one major example, and in fact, this event still leaves traces in our genomes today. Europeans have, on average, about a third or more ancestry deriving from these early farmers. So many people here have this kind of component, and then we also have this blue component, which is this hunter-gatherer component, which derives from the last ice age, maybe. And then there's another component that I don't have time to talk about, um, which came later in the early Bronze Age from the Russian steppes. So you can see we're filling, we're filling the, um, the history with these, with these kind of mixture models and infer um, migrations through time. I want to show one more example that's much more closer to home, maybe, and also closer in time, which um, concerns early medieval changes in Britain, where we have contributed a paper last year it's quite state-of-the-art research, if you will. So in Britain also, we had profound cultural changes. In fact, in this case, after the fall of the Roman Empire in Britain, or Roman administration in Britain, there were changes in, in, uh, in architecture, in culture, in religion, in the language, most importantly. Change in language was quite profound, from an insular Celtic language on the British Isles to a Germanic language, which is Old English, essentially. So this change, of course, happened, but it was hard to sh show whether it was really driven by people. Of course, most scholars were willing to admit that it had something to do with migration. Also, historical sources pointed to that. The so-called Anglo-Saxon migration is something that happened, that, that was reported by literal sources as well. But uh, there was debate to what extent this happened. And I, I want to also briefly mention that this was never an apolitical question. It was clear that for some for some political agendas, it was opportunistic to claim lots of migration. For other political agendas, it was opportunistic to claim lots of continuity. So um, before genetics set to the scene, there was quite a spectrum of opinions that you could have. And this is, of course, something that connects the topic also to how we discuss migration today. It's never an apolitical topic. So how, what does the genetics tell us here? So this is the, almost the last technical chart, I apologize. But if you compare these genomes from the early medieval time to, for example, Bronze Age and Iron Age, we see here a very broad categorization into blue and red. Blue meaning the British ancestry before this Anglo-Saxon migration and red, this continental gene flow from the continent. You see a massive increase in the early medieval times of this continental ancestry. In fact, we measured that on average, 75% of communities in the early medieval time period were migrants from the continent. So clearly a migration of massive scale. And we could look into much more details that I can report today. For example, we could check whether it was mainly a military thing with men, with weapons, or whether it was involving families, and it did involve families. So we did not find a clear sign that it was mainly men or women. It was really whole families that that migrated. So this is, deserves the term mass migration, even though knowing that this is a little bit of a charged term today. But in this case, it's maybe fitting. We don't know much about the motivations, by the way. We also don't know much what the experiences of the people were, right? This is not, we're not putting a value on this, we're just describing things. So this is what happened in the early medieval time period in Britain. And we can also point, pinpoint the sources of this migration. Again, using computer methods, we detect, we, we can sort of circumscribe the region maybe to a region in northern Germany, Netherlands, Denmark, and South Sweden. In one side, we sequence so many genomes that we could actually see how this mixture of locals and 
migrants happened on the spot in Dover, in southeastern England, which was quite a um, high proportion of migrants in this time period. We see a family that we can reconstruct, five-generation pedig five pedigree family, founded by migrants in red here, with offspring and so on. And then at some point you see a blue-colored, so a local ancestry woman coming into this family tree, and they produced mixed offspring. So here we see really how this mixing happened on the spot. And we, in fact, this is representative in the sense that we did not see much evidence for any segregation on the ground, actually. This mixture seemed to be more or less homogenous. Um, okay, and we still have evidence for this today. Genomes from Britain today still harbor about 40% ancestry from this Anglo-Saxon migration. Okay, I'll leave you with three take-home messages. First, humans are a mobile species, and migration did play a key part in many, many time periods of human history. Second, ancient DNA provides a new tool to investigate these things. And third, um, past migrations are still visible in our genomes today. This is not something that just happened in the past, but it has repercussions until today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefan.